could all join me in welcoming Dr. Justine Lee. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> All right, can you guys hear me okay in the back? Awesome. So first of all, a huge thank you to CBM for having me uh, come and lecture today. These are obviously totally different lectures that I'm used to giving in terms of, I usually lecture on emergency, critical care, and toxicology. Um, and what I wanted to basically share is a topic of what I call, what would Jesus do about compassion fatigue? Um, as you guys already know, I'm an independent contractor for multiple companies, so I did want to reveal my conflicts of interest financially. I'm an independent contractor for Merck Animal Health, the ASPCA Animal Poison Control Center, a company called Elevate DVM. I blog for Voice. I'm a criticalist at Animal Emergency and Referral Center, and I'm the CEO and founder of Batgirl. So, what are we going to talk about in this talk? What I wanted to talk about and define is what compassion fatigue is or what burnout is. And you're probably wondering, why do I need to hear this during veterinary school? Because on average, people get super burnt out within their first five years. And it breaks my heart for you to spend a quarter million dollars getting a veterinary education to find out that you're no longer practicing after five years. So a couple of hints that I have about compassion fatigue and burnout. We're gonna talk about recognizing the problem, and then I'm gonna talk about biblical examples of burnout and compassion fatigue in the Bible, because the Bible is littered with evidence of this. I'm gonna talk about what would Jesus do when it comes to compassion fatigue, and we'll talk about steps for prevention. And this is important lifelong um, preventative skills that you want to have in order to make sure that you have self-care. Everyone goes into veterinary school as a compassionate person, but unfortunately, everyone ends up getting burnout. I remember it's always important to have a set goal for when you're going to take time off from the field. And my goal was, and this was always from the beginning, if I ever got frustrated with an animal or I don't want to touch an animal, then I was going to leave the field. I was gonna take time off. And that actually happened to me at the U. In 2008, I remember a veterinary student was walking a black lab down the hallway. And back then, this was before digital radiograph, so we still had those big x-ray folders. And this lab door was about to jump on me, and I literally had an x-ray folder, and I went like this <laughs> so, to block the dog. And that's when I was like, I'm burnt out. I need to take time off. And that's when I went, to, went into industry for several years. So what exactly is compassion fatigue? Ca compassion fatigue is defined as, a, defined as a deep physical, emotional, and spiritual exhaustion accompanied by acute emotional pain. We start to see signs of compassion fatigue when you have feelings of hopelessness and depression, when you have no feelings of joy and accomplishment, when you're easily startled, when you can't separate your personal life from your professional life, or when you start blaming and complaining about others. There's a couple of classic signs that we seek with compassion fatigue, what we call avoidance behavior, having physical signs of illness. You don't feel good, you have a headache, you don't want to exercise, you feel trapped or de drained, uh, you may have high anxiety, you have increased anger or irritability, you're indifferent towards others or towards animals, like I was, where I didn't want to touch animals anymore. There's loss of meaning of life, you feel victimized by your job, or you have intrusive thoughts of work. That's a little bit different from burnout. I personally feel like I was really burnt out after doing 15, 18 years of emergency medicine. And so the definition of burnout is exhaustion of physical or emotional strength or motivation, usually as a result of prolonged stress or frustration. And this becomes very gradual, but can lead to a breaking point. When it comes to burnout, a lot of people will start to lose the ability to have good self-care. What does that mean? It means you're not sleeping well, you have poor nutrition, you have decreased exercise. That sounds classically like your third and fourth year of veterinary school. <laughs> you have stress-related ailments. You, there may be risk for substance abuse, anger issues, depression, and suicide. And I'm sure you guys are probably aware of the increased prevalence of our field of veterinary medicine being so predisposed to suicide. It used to be dentists 20 years ago, and unfortunately now it's veterinarians. And so we have to be good advocates for both ourselves and also for our colleagues. 
Some people believe that burnout takes longer as compared to compassion fatigue. Semantically, they think that compassion fatigue is a subset of burnout. And it's often due to frustration, red tape, your home environment, your work environment, your colleagues, or the pace of life. And so you can see why emergency clinicians are even more predisposed to burnout. They have a crazy pace, they're working overnights, they have poor sleep. So again, a lot of contributing factors. What are some classic clinical signs that we see with burnout? Again, feeling like you have very little to give or offer the community, your family, your friends, or your clients. Detachment for your patients or your coworkers. A decline in social contact. You don't want to hang out with your colleagues or your friends anymore. A depersonalization of others. Negative attitudes towards work or failure, failure to connect. Lowered self-esteem. And the feeling of inadequacy or loss of self-respect. So, what's the difference between compassion fatigue and burnout? Semantically, who cares? <gasps> my general easy way of determining it is, do I love my job? And if you say, yes, I still love my job, but I'm feeling a lot of these signs, it probably means that you have compassion fatigue. Versus, no, you don't like your job anymore, you hate even driving up to the clinic, that is a sign of burnout. So, like I mentioned before, why are we even talking about this in veterinary school? Because we know compassion fatigue and burnout affect these professions that you see listed up there. It's usually dedicated, successful, caring people who are very loving, and that's classically the veterinary profession. So healthcare professionals, people who volunteer with NGOs or charitable organizations, law enforcement, fire departments, EMS, Professions that help, so clergy, teachers, people who do animal rescues, even attorneys, even though I joke they're not caring, can still be affected by compassion fatigue and burnout. You guys probably can't see this chart, but I, um, I would recommend just going to the original DVM 360 article, where you see a negative number directly correlates with good quality of life, where you see a very positive number contributes to burnout. So being a veterinarian in small animal medicine, you're a plus eight, which is the highest number on this chart. Going to Virginia Tech for vet school is a negative 10, which is great. They must enjoy veterinary school. Um, but there's a lot of predisposing factors to burnout. And again, this is taken directly from DVM 360. Why are we seeing so much burnout? They actually documented in a study on DVM 360 that burnout starts at graduation. And that's because you just worked really hard your fourth year to excel in clinics. So again, a big warning sign if you're feeling burnt out But by the time you graduate. It peaks after five years of graduation. And then the good thing is after that, if you can get through those five years, the quality of life actually improves as the degree of burnout drops. Why are we seeing burnout and compassion fatigue? Well, it's because of long hours. You don't work a 40-hour work week. It ends up becoming a 60-hour week because of low pay or high uh, debt-to-income ratio, having you know, 200 dollars to $250,000 of student debt. Having a high-stress job, you've only neutered or spayed two animals before you're expected to spay and neuter you know, really, really quickly. Um, again, it also is contributed by our workaholic personalities um, in veterinary school. And again, this becomes a lifelong problem. This is also a chart that came from DVM 360. And if you look at it, it's what are your following greatest fears about the veterinary profession in veterinary medicine? And what's scary is that 28% felt like they weren't able to pay off their income. 33% uh, felt like they had loss of balance in uh, their career, their personal life, or very poor work-life balance. A smaller percentage was worried about uh, being reported to the state, uh, being sued for malpractice. So a lot of negative impact factors in veterinary medicine when it comes to our fear factors about where our profession is going. What else contributes to it? Like I mentioned, working long, long hours, working for an uh, unpleasant boss or with people where there may be a prevalence of bullying within the work field, working for different organizational values that may differ from what you believe versus what the company or the hospital believes, or performing work that requires skills that you don't have yet. So being able to whip out cases every 15 minutes or being able to spay or neuter or do a cystotomy or a resection anastomosis the first month that you graduate, it contributes a lot of stress and contributes towards burnout. 
How does this directly affect our job though? Well, there's oftentimes high absenteeism, uh, there's high turnover where people are leaving their job after one year, one and a half years. It could lead to higher interpersonal conflict, both at home and also um, in the work field. I'm a big believer that you should write on your Google Calendar to test yourself at this website once a year. This is called the Pro uh, Quality of Life Test, and you basically just sit, um, sit down, print out a couple of forms, and take this test where you can assess your quality of life and your degree of compassion fatigue. And for me, I was really happy to report. I took it a couple of weeks ago and I scored really well. I have good quality of life. But I couldn't have said the same five years ago or 10 years ago. So really good that you have a set point where you're gonna check in every couple of years so you can assess, no, my score is very low. I need to look for another job or I need to do things in my life that are gonna improve my quality of life. Which leads me to what would Jesus do? As a little bit of a quick background about myself, I'm a PK, which stands for I'm a pastor's kid. And my dad is the equivalent of the Chinese version of Billy Graham. He's a really famous Christian minister. He preaches all over Asia, um, all over um, China and uh, Taiwan. And so for me, I always grew up in a Christian household. I was a really strong Christian in undergrad. I was one of the leaders for Campus Crusade for Christ. I was very active at Virginia Tech. And because of some church politics and some other stuff that was going on, when I got to vet school, I actually took a 10-year hiatus from being a Christian. Um, there were multiple issues that were contributing to that. Um, and so it was something where I would still occasionally go to church. I mean, it wasn't until I finished my vet school, my internship, and my residency where I even started walking and becoming uh, active in the Christian faith again. So. I will say that it's especially hard during veterinary school and in your first few years because right now you're really focusing just on surviving school and getting through veterinary school and becoming a good veterinarian. But I'm hoping that um, by just talking about what would Jesus do, we can help minimize our amount of compassion fatigue and burnout, especially in those pivotal first five years where you graduate. There are plenty of examples in the Bible of burnout and compassion fatigue. Moses. Jonah, a half of the minor prophets uh, were super burnt out, and even Jesus had shown signs too. So for example, Jonah, right after the miraculous, he just got spit out by a big fish or whale. Right after he had, um, he was um, preaching to Nineveh, he actually said in Jonah 4, 3, now Lord, take away my life, for it is better for me to die than to live. And he was just completely burnt out. Bunch of other minor prophets like Elijah, right after he had the awesome miracle of proving to the priests of Baal that, um, the, uh, that fire would come down from God, he actually said, I have had enough, Lord. Take my life. I am no better than my ancestors. So again, throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament, there are examples of compassion fatigue and burnout. This is especially prevalent um, in the Old Testament with uh, bib biblical prophets. They all showed burnout, they all complained, they didn't always listen to God. And um, the classic example is with Moses. Moses' father-in-law actually said to him, what, are you, what you are doing is not good. You will only wear yourself out. The work is too heavy for you. You cannot handle it alone. And nothing's more depressing when your family says that to you. In Exodus 32, when he was coming down from Mount Sinai and he saw uh, the people rebelling, he destroyed the tablets in, in a fit of anger. Um, he was burnt out from seeing people disobey. And it was in Exodus 34 and also in Deuteronomy 9 where he says that um, he was interceding for the people. He was ne neither eating or drinking because of compassion fatigue and burnout. In Numbers 11, he says, the burden is too heavy for me. And so again, you see lots of examples where he sort of given up, um, became really bitter and cynical and developed compassion fatigue. Even Jesus got compassion fatigue. Why? Because he's constantly surrounded by crowds who are demanding things of him. They're demanding miracles. Um, even his disciples didn't always believe him. And he was surrounded by betrayal with Judas. So what did he do to avoid compassion fatigue? These are a couple things that I think biblically we can apply to our own life when we're approaching compassion fatigue and burnout. 
First of all, he took time off for himself and took breaks. He would slip away to be with God and to pray. He maintained boundaries to guard himself. After that, um, after he sent the multitudes away, he knew he could not be performing miraculous works 24-7. He needed uh, to be alone. He needed time to prioritize his own time also. He also surrounded himself by companions, by his disciples, by a few of his cherished disciples versus always being surrounded in that crowd. He expressed his feelings. He was still and he rested. And um, he also believed in the importance of meditation and in prayer. So first of all, taking breaks. Again, even Jesus took breaks away from people to pray and to be around his disciples um, amidst his ministry. Mark 1.35 says, And in the early morning, while it was still dark, he arose and went out and departed to a lonely place and was praying there. So even Jesus withdrew himself um, to go to lonely places, to be by himself, and to pray. The second important thing is setting boundaries so we guard ourselves. How does this apply to veterinary medicine? This means you don't go in on your days off. Our workaholic personalities are always worrying about our cases because we're worried that we screwed something up. So we're constantly checking on them from home, from the computer, to make sure that patient did okay. We're worrying about our cases at night to the point where some veterinarians, as soon as they graduate, they can't sleep because they're tossing and turning, wondering if their spay is bleeding out in a cage. Um, they're neurotically downloading la apps like IDEX to check your blood work. So you get a text message each time your patient's blood work comes in. Do not do that, okay? <laughs> that will burn you out and that is not setting appropriate barriers. The second important part of um, setting barriers is sticking up for yourself. So I talked last year uh, to the CBM about the importance of what it means to work as a Christian in the veterinary field in a dog-eat-dog -dog world. And just because you're a Christian doesn't mean you automatically take the crappy shifts or you work every single weekend. So again, speak up for yourself, delegate what you can, make sure you clarify your boundaries as best you can, and learn to say no. And this was a really important lesson that took me 20 years to learn, but um, this was my New Year's, New Year's resolution for 2015, was to get better at saying no. Because we, as veterinary professionals, are so nice and we wanna help people and we're like, oh, okay, yeah, I guess I can do that, I'll, I'll do that for you, when really you don't have that energy to do it. So I always say, ask yourself a couple of questions. First of all, does this directly benefit or help me? Is it going to affect your, yet, your stress to yes ratio? If you say yes, is this gonna stress you out more? So again, really important factor. And then the last factor I always ask myself is does this spark joy? And if it doesn't spark joy, I don't think it's good to say yes to that, okay? So ask yourself those few questions before you say yes or before you just make that decision to say no, just so you can set up some boundaries for yourself in life. The third thing that Jesus did was he prioritized his time. Don't go in on your days off. Prioritize your family first. When in doubt, don't spend extra time at the clinic unless you're actually supposed to be on. And I just wrote a blog on learning to be an efficient veterinarian. Why? Because I work with some amazing veterinarians, especially when they're coming off overnights, but all they like to do is chat and say, hey, what's up, and chat, chat, chat but they're there for another three to four hours after their shift catching up on paperwork. And that's gonna directly affect your work-life balance. That's gonna affect the time that you're spending with family. So when in doubt, try to be a bit more efficient. Super hard when you're in clinics, when you're just learning it. Um, but again, try to develop an efficient way of practicing um, so it can ultimately help prioritize your time. The third thing that Jesus did was he surrounded himself with companionship. And really important that we make sure that we have support from colleagues. There are actually organizations, I call them veterinary Bible studies, where veterinarians or veterinary professionals will get together once a month and to talk about cases or to talk about work-life balance um, just so they have a voice to be able to um, commiserate with. I joke that my husband is terrible 
at being able to empathize with me because he doesn't want to hear my disgusting stories. And then I popped the abscess and all this pus came out and this dog kept on vomiting. So a lot of times your family members don't always want to hear that. Um, so for me, I found it very useful to occasionally hang out with veterinary people where I could um, basically have a Bible study or have fellowship time where we could vent. We would stop talking, we set a timer. After 30 minutes, you're not allowed to talk about anything veterinary related. The fourth thing that Jesus did was express his feelings. When he was about to be uh, crucified, he wept in the garden. And so realizing that it is okay to express your emotions. And I would say myself personally, I'm pretty, um, I don't cry a lot. But I had a shift a couple of weeks ago at the clinic where I literally just was so exhausted. I had euthanized probably 60% of my patients that day, many of which were savable. And I literally just sat in the driveway and cried for a few minutes before I even went into the house. Um, I don't normally do that, but I was so burnt out from that, uh, those two days where I just euthanized so many patients, and that's okay. And even Jesus did that. So being able to express your feelings is part of your um, stress relief. I always say be real too. And this was a struggle that I found where I took my 10 year hiatus from Christianity during vet school because I would see a lot of people who were Christians who uh, weren't real. And for me that was very, very hard. Um, and I always tell people be real. It's okay to have the feelings that you have. Biblically, even Moses was angry. You know, so I always say, uh, make sure to be in touch with your own feelings and be real when you need to. The next important aspect that Jesus did was be still. Most of us nowadays are not still because we can whip out our phone and check email and we could check our Fitbit, see how active we are. Uh, we're always on, there's always a TV, radio on, some type of noise on. So I actually am a firm believer of taking that time to just be silent, just to sit, to take time for yourself, to mentally mind dump, um, actually picturing in your mind what your stress factors are and mentally dumping them out at the curb, especially before you get home right after the clinic. Uh, so for me, when I'm driving home, sometimes I don't listen to any podcasts, I don't listen to the radio, um, I just want that quiet time just to be still. The next thing is digging into the Word. So having quiet time where if it takes you five minutes just to be able to meditate on the Word, if that gives you peace, Again, finding that time whenever you can fit it. So for me, I like it when it's quiet, first thing in the morning. If you don't have a lot of time, you have kids, you're gonna come home to a crazy household, literally listening to it via podcast or through Bible apps where they read you the Bible. You don't even have to read it yourself. Um, going, there's a ton of free content in terms of devotional guides online nowadays that are totally free. So again, taking five minutes a day or five minutes a couple of times a week just to have that quiet time to dig in. One of my favorite verses is Matthew 11, come unto me all who are weary and burdened and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me and lean from me, learn from me for I am gentle and humble in heart and you will find rest for your souls for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And I always like to mentally picture I'm a big backpacker. Um, I always like to picture me with my backpack on and those are my burdens. And sometimes I'm still carrying them when I'm supposed to be releasing them. So when in doubt, just be aware. Um, Jesus says directly in the Bible, come unto him to relieve that burden. Remember that God gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. In Isaiah, he says, even youths grow tired and weary and young men stumble and fall but those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. In other words, don't do it on your own because it is really hard to do it on your own and survive the debt load, the stress factors, the malpractice, the threats of being sued, um, and relying on God's strength for refreshment. Another important aspect, even if you're not a Christian, is downloading the awesome meditation apps that are on your iPhone. Um, I was never a meditator. I can't sit still for five minutes or when I'm sitting still, I'm like, okay, these are the groceries I need to buy and these are the five things that I need to do as soon as I'm done meditating. <laughs> and I used to joke, I had this cartoon of this woman meditating saying, hurry up, I don't have all day. <laughs> but there are times, uh, whether or not you're a Christian or not, where it is very, very helpful to have that quiet time just to meditate. 
You can do it while driving to work. I know it sounds crazy, but literally just having that silent time, having both hands on your wheel of your car and just quietly purging um, and not thinking of anything. I like to do this first thing in the morning or at night. Um, I have, there's a ton of free apps on this, uh, again, that are totally free. Uh, one of my favorite ones I think is called um, Headmind or something like that. So again, a bunch of free apps that you can check out. The next thing is prayer. Do I sit down and pray every day? No. My most peaceful time where I feel the most connected to God is when I'm hiking with my dog in Minnehaha or walking along the Mississippi with my dog. There's no noise. Uh, it's the most peaceful time for me just to be out in nature. And I don't know about you guys, but I always, always taught the acronym ACTS when I pray. And I'm a super casual prayer. In other words, I'm walking and praying at the same time. Um, and I was always taught the acronym ACTS. Adoration, confession, thanksgiving, and supplication. Um, so sort of a dummy's guide. This was literally Googled off of dummies.com. <laughs> it's not even a Christian website. Um, and it basically are four easy parameters or four different aspects to pray for. Adoration, giving God praise and honor. The next minute, confession, asking for grace. The third thing, thanksgiving, verbalizing what you're grateful for. And I actually think this is really important when you just step back and say, these are the three things that I am thankful for today. That Rottweiler didn't bite my face off, <laughs> that I'm healthy and I have 10 fingers and 10 toes, and that I got into vet school and I graduated. Okay, so they could just be three simple things that you're grateful for every day. The last thing is supplication, praying for the needs of others or for yourself. So for me, I've always used this as an acronym for prayer. The other important part of meditation and prayer, it could literally just be inhaling and exhaling. Um, the clinic always makes fun of me because I'm a deep sire. <laughs> so I'll be sitting there and I'll be like, <sighs> and it's not out of expiration. It's not out of frustration. It's just because that's what my body normally does when I'm, <laughs> when I'm stressed out. And so for me, uh, just closing your eyes and focusing and you know, literally taking inhalation and exhalation and focusing on that. Going to a quiet place, for me, it's mentally picture me walking around the beach of Grand Cayman uh, when I'm really stressed or having a positive association or image in my head. Or the third thing is listening to music. So whatever you need to do to find that peaceful state, really important lesson you can learn which will help you with your stress level as you go through your veterinary career. Rest and refreshment, so important, especially when you enter your fourth years. You don't get a lunch break for the rest of your life, <laughs> seriously. Um, sometimes you're doing an emergency, sometimes you don't have time to eat meals at all. And it even says in 1 Kings and all over the Bible that you need rest and refreshment. Um, in 1 Kings 9, God allowed Elijah to sleep. God provided him food to eat. A couple of verses later, he had some sleep some more. A couple of verses later, angels bring him food. I don't know about you, but when I'm in the clinic, on a busy Saturday or busy whatever day, Friday, you can become so dehydrated, you don't even feel like you have time to drink. So I'm a big advocate carrying a Nalgene around so you have some source of water, always carrying some snacks on you. Um, I always joke at the clinic, there's this one doctor's desk that I always work at, and sometimes when I'm really stressed, I'll turn around and someone put a chocolate chip cookie on my keyboard. <laughs> and they probably do that because they know I get really hangry hungry, angry. <laughs> so I'm like, oh yeah, see, I, I do need food. I'm getting, getting kind of cranky here. So take that time for rest and refreshment. It is biblical. You're supposed to stay hydrated. You're supposed to eat and take care of yourself. What else can you do? Get, get eight hours of sleep. And I'm willing to bet that none of you guys get eight hours of sleep because you're probably studying or studying till midnight. You wake up at six. So important that you realize the effect of chronic sleep deprivation. During my internship at Angel, I probably worked 100 hours a week, and I literally was up at the clinic at 5 a.m., and I am not a morning person, not a super early morning person. And when people would call me at 8.30 p.m., I, I would be like, what's wrong with you? Don't you know I'm an intern? I'm sleeping. But when it really try to get those eight hours of sleep, because it's so important for you, my resolution for 2016 is to go to bed 30 minutes earlier and to wake up 30 minutes earlier because now I have more quiet time in the beginning of the day and I really found that to be um, hugely refreshing for me. No electronic stimulation after 9 p.m. 
which means you don't open your laptop, you don't check your email, you turn off your phone, and it's off, okay? Setting your do not disturb functions, so only in emergencies when people call um, can they get through to you by text or by phone. Um, avoiding electronic stimulation at set by before 7 a.m. I used to get in bed, my alarm would go off, and I would lie there and check my email. Normal people shouldn't do that. You don't need to check your email in bed, right? So my New Year's resolution for 2015 was you don't check your email from bed. You actually have to get up, turn on the coffee maker, let the dog out, feed the dog, and wait half an hour to an hour before you even have any electronic stimulation, okay? Um, unplugging from bad news. Um, I don't like to watch 10 p.m. news um, only because I don't want to hear about the last murder in Minneapolis or whatever disaster is happening. Uh, it can be really stressful. It's just emotionally draining for you. So instead, I'd rather just plug into a podcast, uh, one of my favorite speakers or preachers, plug into God for perspective, wisdom, joy, and strength instead of bad news at night. A couple other things on rest and refreshment. Eat three square meals a day. How many of you guys do that? Good, a handful. It is important for you to eat breakfast and to ask yourself, as you're wolfing down cereal in front of your kitchen sink, ask yourself, does this spark joy? Does this spark joy to like wolf down breakfast like this? No. Sit yourself down, it'll take an extra two minutes, but you are worth it, okay? So that is really my philosophy. If it doesn't spark joy to shove a peanut butter and jelly sandwich in the corner of the clinic room, take a couple of minutes to get away so you can do it. Carry snacks again. Um, make sure you try to have a lunch break if possible. Drink 40 ounces of water a day. I know it sounds crazy, but you literally just need to do a couple of simple steps for good self-care. And I'm not against you know, caffeine and I'm not against alcohol, but studies have shown multiple, um, you know, multiple cups, multiple ounces can be detrimental. So when you're drinking coffee all day, you're jittery, you're tachycardic, you're hypertensive, you're probably a little more anxious, right? So again, all things in moderation. Just look at some factors that can help improve your self-care. The next thing I wanted to talk about is take time for yourself. This is really important uh, to take time with your partner, your spouse, your children, whatever you have. It not only reaffirms your commitment to why you're here, but while veterinary medicine is a priority, you never want to miss certain aspects of family. Um, it's not worth your job, okay? It's not until your family member has a diagnosis of cancer or you li lose a family member really acutely where you say, I wish I spent more time with them instead of picking up an extra shift. When they surveyed, um, they did the they did this huge Cornell study where they surveyed people who were you know, greater than 70 uh, to 100 years of age, and they asked them what their five biggest regrets are. And you can Google it, it's a great TED talk. But the number one was working too hard and not spending more time with their children. So again, nobody ever is on their deathbed saying, gosh, I wish I worked harder and wished more, wish I worked more Saturday shifts, right? So try to keep your perspective. Make sure you have hobbies and non-veterinary hobbies. Um, I do think it's really important for mental health, uh, for a good uh, escape from veterinary medicine, whether or not it's running, uh, for me it's hockey, it's ultimate frisbee, it's reading, it's gardening, it's traveling. So make sure you have a good outlet for yourself. Try to keep the Sabbath, whether or not it's Sunday or Saturday or one day where you don't do anything. There was a study that was done in World War I and what they basically found was that workers are more efficient when they work six days versus seven days. You can't work seven days. Whether or not it's checking email and working on something, even when you're not officially off, uh, even when you're not officially on, you're not as productive. It says directly in Exodus, six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh is a Sabbath to the Lord, and your God, to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work. Now don't get me wrong, I still check my email. I still do a couple of things, but really take time to recharge on that one day. Um, it's okay to turn off for one day. Remember, you are not made for the Sabbath. The Sabbath is made for you. The last part I wanted to talk about when it comes to preventing compassion fatigue is taking care of self. And that's what I've been talking about for the past 20 minutes. But for me, I like to have 30-day short-term goals. 
Um, I'm very, and most of us in this room are very goal oriented. So I like to do something for 30 days that's better self care. I'm going to purposely drink 40 ounces every single day for 30 days. I'm going to do 50 push ups once a day for 30 days. I'm going to do X, Y, and Z for 30 days. It takes you a certain amount of time to build that habit. So what you're trying to do is build good habits towards self care. When was the last time any of you guys read a non-veterinary book? I hear laughing. <laughs> Seriously, take the time to read one non-veterinary book a year. It's depressing when you know the stats. The average American reads less than one book a year. And so I try to read one book a month. I try to listen to one book a month on, on Audible or on a book on tape. Really important that you guys obviously are working hard to get into veterinary school, but take that time to do good things for yourself for good self-care. Again, like I said, learn to say no. So again, weigh the stress to yes ratio. And this is important because biblically, you are supposed to love yourself. You're supposed to have good self-care. It says in Galatians 5.14, love your neighbor as yourself, which means you're supposed to love yourself too. Again, you're the most important person in your life, so you do need to have good mental health and good self-care. Cut yourself some slack. A couple of years ago, I went to this work-life balance conference, and um, it was really interesting what I learned from this conference. It was having, taking little baby steps at improving your self-care. I used to have, well I still have sometimes, a to-do list that has eight to 10 things on it a day. Normal people don't have eight to 10 things on their to-do list, right? Have three things and cut yourself the slack of saying, you know what, I'm just gonna do these three things today because what I normally accomplish in one day with eight to 10 to-do things, that would take someone a day and a half. It's okay to cut yourself some slack in some areas. I also am of the philosophy, is it worth the money? And my general philosophy is it's not worth picking up an extra shift at the clinic if it's going to burn you out, predispose you to compassion fatigue, take you away from time with your friends or family um, when it may not be worth the money. So again, really focus on that self-care. For me, mental things I like to do, I feel, most, I feel the closest to God when I'm hiking with my dog. So again, making sure you're taking time to do that, being out in nature, having non-veterinary related hobbies uh, for self-care, just so you don't have that compassion fatigue. Again, like I mentioned, have a couple of things that you're thankful for, and whether or not it's setting a timer every day, saying when this alarm goes off at 3 p.m. After, every afternoon, I'm gonna think of three things that I'm grateful for. So again, that's a big part of that ACTS acronym of Thanksgiving. Having a feel-good uh, journal where you did something awesome today, you palpated a lymph node or you palpated a, a splenomegaly, so something that um, you can document that you did something well. Uh, remembering what you're thankful for. Having a good conversation a day, so not always complaining to someone saying, and then we had to do this in clinics and this terrible thing happened and this intern was super mean to me, but focusing on one good conversation a day. And saying thank you more. Um, studies have found that people who are more grateful um, have better quality of life, they're happier in life. A Couple of verses uh, that I wanted to leave you with. As we have received mercy, we don't lose heart. Let us not grow weary from doing good, for in due season we will, we will reap if we do not lose heart. As for the rest of you, dear brothers and sisters, never get tired of doing good. Um, I also wanted to leave with you John 15, remain in me, as I have also remained in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me, and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Remember to get your refreshment and life from God. Again, our field is so predisposed to compassion, fatigue, and burnout because we live in stressful work situations. We have that financial stress. We have pet owners who are accusing us of trying to make money and not saving their pet because we're trying to make money. We have a workaholic personality that is unforgiving to ourselves. We beat ourselves up because of our INTJ personalities. And again, these factors are what are predisposing us to burnout and fatigue. We're also often overworked, uh, so we're emotionally frayed, we're more short-tempered. Um, so again, really realizing that um, because our field is so predisposed to this, we really need to focus on self-care. 
My last two slides on um, some helpful hints. Again, find God wherever you can, whether or not it's on a dog walk, whether or not it's on that quiet commute home with the radio off. Find a support network, a church or a small group, a Bible study that you feel supported in. Um, as you know, I'm a huge fan of podcasts because of that girl podcasts. My all-time favorite podcasts are by uh, Greg Boyd, who's a pastor here in St. Paul, by Tim Keller, uh, by my own pastor at First Baptist Church in downtown Minneapolis, um, Matt Clausen, and a couple of YouTube videos that I love. I don't always have time to go to church because I'm business traveling, so literally I'll just listen to my church. Um, while I'm driving. I'm not watching the YouTube video, but I'm just listening to it. And so, love Francis Chan, love his books. Uh, there's a pastor. I had to literally Google bald pastor, Texas, and his name is Kerry Shook. <laughs> uh, great pastor. He's got a really cool podcast, too. Totally free app called Own It 365. Um, they will read you the Bible. You just have to press play. So great reading plans on there also. So great ways of being able to meditate, pray, and dig into the Word. And with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. The biggest thing to remember is you will get burnt out. You will develop compassion fatigue. Um, find your refreshment in life so you're not burnt out from God, from self-care, from meditation and prayer. And with that, I'm happy to answer any questions you guys might have.